This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. You're gonna acknowledge me. Welcome to the WWE Podcast. It is Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023. A bit of a shorter mailbag tonight. Normally, you guys are hounding me, but you took a week off. Gave me a bit of a respite. I, I, I love these shows, but this week is a especially tough. Still still kind of on the men from uh, vacation. and So it'll be a bit shorter of a show, but let's dive into it. You guys, by the way, during WrestleMania season and beyond, if you want to join us ad-free, patreon.com slash WWE podcast. One dollar gets you in the door. Anything higher, you get video, you can come on the show, that kind of thing. And even merchandise. We have t-shirts, we have mugs. If you go in the uh, upper tiers, that's available to you. And uh, you can also join us on Apple Podcasts if you just want to go on the native app. Apple Podcasts has a free seven-day trial where you can go and experience all of our shows ad-free for seven uh, days. And then beyond that, it's $2.99 a month or $29.99 for the whole year. That's two months for free. And lastly, WWEpodcast.com. You can go VIP, and it's also $3 a month for ad-free everything. So not a bad deal heading into WrestleMania season, I don't think. But of course, I'm biased, right? So, All right, let's dive into it. Let's get to our emails. And again, we don't have too many of these. I'm going to start off with an email that I don't know if it was meant for the mailbag, but we're going to do it anyway. And uh, we're going to censor some of the swearing. All right. This is from Jared, patron Jared. And he says a bit unhinged here. So sorry, Matt. I'm so effing sick of New Day getting a win over LA Knight. I simply don't understand it. Holy S. LOL. Sorry. A bit angry. Uh, my mailbag, yeah, so you're saying the mailbag is going to be fun, but he's you're saying that I just don't understand the burying of LA Knight to the friggin' New Day. Yeah, I saw that on uh, SmackDown with LA Knight losing to Xavier Woods. <laughs> At this point, I'm, I really don't know if LA Knight has uh, won a match yet. But here's what I'll say that's very encouraging. Even though he hasn't won a match, he's losing to the god-awful New Day, is that... He's getting over and getting bigger reactions than you would think that he should get or he should be getting. He has no business getting the reactions he's getting. And the crowd seems to generally cheer for him. I mean, he's not getting booed overwhelmingly. People are reacting to him even though he continues to lose and lose and lose. And he's one of the candidates... Uh, that he's going to go to Mania and Austin's going to come out and he's going to stun LA Knight. I think he's a good candidate for that. You know, I, I know that it's just kind of he's going to be a sacrificial lamb, but at least you'll remember that he worked with Austin. Hell, we had Austin Theory get stunned by Steve Austin last year and look where he's at now. So I don't think it would hurt him at all. Uh, I think the Miz and or LA Knight and or if they're a co-hosting smack or co-hosting WrestleMania somehow, Austin's a perfect candidate to come out, drop some stunners and, you know, have a good time. So... My point, though, is think about how L.A. Knight is being perceived versus how many wins he's gotten. So that is a testament to how good L.A. Knight is on the mic, his presence, his entrance music, his just everything about him except the fact that he's not winning. In the ring, he think he's really good. Although we haven't seen a full-fleshed match. He did have a match with Cody Rhodes a couple weeks ago on Raw, and that was, the I think, the best match he's had to date. Credit to Cody as well. But... I think it's a encouraging sign for LA Knight that he's getting that reaction, even though he's losing to you know the worst of the worst in terms of character of you know Kofi Kingston and and and, uh, and Xavier Woods. So character guys, character. So if you like the New Day, I'm not doubting their success or anything like that or denying it. Rather, just y'all know they are the epitome. They're the bane of my existence when it comes to pro wrestling. Okay, that's all I have to say about that. But. There, how about some encouraging words for you, Jared? So hopefully I'm talking you off the ledge a little bit. And uh, let's get to our next email. And this one is Ari from Israel. And he says, good morning, everyone. You talked last episode about the about LA Knight, speaking of LA Knight, 
and how good he is and how great of a future he has. I think LA Knight is something like MJF. Uh, yeah. I, 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 well, I'll get to that. I'll finish your email. It's very brief. I like LA so much. I hope WWE will know what to do with him. Maybe even buy MJF and then they'll have a match. I guess that's too much to ask. Thanks. And you have a, you've been having great podcasts. Well, thank you so much, Ari, for your input. And the hell LA Knight thing, I mean, I can't say enough about him right now. If I keep talking about him, it's just going to be redundant. But when you bring MJF into the equation, do I think he's MJF? No. I see the comparisons, though. He has that same magnetic feel when he's talking. Now, MJF on the mic is certainly going to outduel nearly everyone he comes in contact with. And I mean nearly everyone. I have said this from day one that I hope WWE pays him as much as they need. I have a feeling that they won't be able to outbid uh, Tony Khan only because MJF is kind of what's keeping them together, at least not, not the whole company. It won't collapse without MJF, but he is a pillar of that brand. And I think they'll do whatever it takes to keep him where WWE is like, well, I'll, you know, I'll give him a solid offer. You know, take, we can take it or leave it right. WWE is not going to collapse where MJF is a much bigger part of AEW and they need him more than WWE does. But that said, John Cena and, and MJF on the microphone, it has to happen. I don't care if they never have a match, but having them in a ring together to battle each other verbally, I mean, how, how much money do you want? Just take it out of my account. Take whatever you want. <laughs> so, uh, but as far as LA Knight goes and MJF, for them to have a match together, it's possible. It, I think it's going to really depend on how, where LA Knight is in terms of the <clears throat> pecking order once MJF or if MJF gets signed uh, in November or rather January. So it's dependent. I could see it happening. But right now, MJF. I think if I was to be a betting man is probably going to be able to st or will stay in AEW because they'll probably pay him more and they'll outbid uh, WWE. That's my thought. All right. Thanks, buddy. Let's get to uh, Mr. DJ Kuzmo. And he writes in and says, this is DJ Kuzmo back at it again, your mailbag show. So your first topic, the WWE Hall of Fame. This seems like the changing of the old guard of how the WWE makes decisions with who should be inducted in the Hall of Fame. So far, we have Rey Mysterio, the great Muda, and the legendary comedian Andy Kaufman. I've heard of Andy Kaufman, the comedian, from watching old episodes of Saturday Night Live, but I never knew he actually wrestled. Kind of odd to me. The great Muda has not actively wrestled in the WWE, even though he has made some contributions to this industry of professional wrestling over 30 years, for over 30 years. Then we have Rey Mysterio, who still is an active wrestler on the roster and is a full-time wrestler and also has contributed to the industry for over 30 years. My point is, do you think that the process of who gets inducted into the Hall of Fame is solely focused on the contributions that the inductees have made in the industry outside of WWE or for the amount of years they've been into the WWE? Well, I, I don't think, honestly, the number of years is as much of a concern. I, I think it's a you know, in the top 10 of concerns. But to me, it's how, what impact did you have on the business? What is your legacy? How did you change the business? You know, because to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, you know, you must have had some major impact on the business. This is not a consolation prize. This is not a everyone gets a trophy deal, and it shouldn't be. Do I think they should actually move more selective of who goes in? Yes. And I actually don't think they should do it every year because I feel like when they do it every year, they're going to run out of people and start lowering their standards. You know, like I don't think that every year is necessary. If, if somehow it works out every year and they feel that there's someone coming up that is deserving, then yeah. But to me, every year, I'm every year I'm looking around like, yeah, why is this every year? It should only, I know that the MLB does it this way, but I don't know. I feel like it should only be done at WrestleMania times when it's they deem someone worthy. That said, uh, I think that how they select somebody, again, is based on the impact of the business. Longevity can come into play in some instances, but like for take, for example, Stone Cold Steve Austin was really only hot, hot from 97 to 03 when he retired, five, six years, right? That's when he was the, the hottest. Now, of course, 
after that, he was you know, the Raw co-GM with Eric Bischoff, and he kind of came in and out of WrestleMania, in and out of Raws, and stunned people. And he, he was a part-time guy. He was forced out of the business, but he didn't get real hot till 97. You take out 07, or rather uh, 97 to 03, and you know Stone Cold did not have a Hall of Fame career. And before that, of course, he was with the Hollywood Blondes and all that. My point is, Austin was only super, super hot for about, say, five years, right? where he was dominant and, and unbelievably over. You take somebody like The Undertaker, who had the longevity of like 30 years, right? Two legendary guys, much, much different in terms of uh, the length of time. You know, I, and I just, I think that the length of time isn't as important as it is to say to the, the panel, whoever this is, of of judges, these, these mysterious judges, which we all know is just, you know, Triple H and probably Vince to some degree and, uh, you know, executive management who decide who goes in is what impact did they leave, did they leave on the business? You know, uh, did they ever turn their back on us? Are they giving, are, are they currently in any hot water, right? You don't want to, you don't want them to induct somebody that's currently under investigation or has some kind of outstanding issues going on in the public eye. You know, so like you need to consider that. And I think that's generally what it is. And it's a uh, certainly a subjective thing, though. But, you know, they also have the Hall of Fame wing or the uh, celebrity wing. I think wasn't Bob Barker inducted or uh, Kid Rock, I know, was Mike Tyson was. And th- you know, those are the, the guys that didn't contribute to the business in terms of phys- physicality, but left a lasting impact. Where they, you know, maybe have been there for a very brief time, but had a huge impact, and that's why they dedicated a celebrity wing, quote unquote, for to the Hall of Fame. All right. Plus, I don't understand why celebrities have been inducted to the Hall of Fame, like Snoop Dogg, William Shatner, Ozzy Osbourne, Donald Trump. Don't get me started with him, just to name a few. And they haven't wrestled. Just my opinion. Well, again, don't forget that's the celebrity wing. They aren't putting those guys in with the the regular wrestlers they will slay they will say slay they will say when they're being inducted that this is the celebrity wing again there's no physical hall of fame yet but that's the the distinction is that it's for the uh the celebrity wing of the hall of fame i totally agree if they never made that distinction if they didn't distinct you know ozzy osbourne from the undertaker from the contributions made to the <clears throat> the business, of course, that'd be ridiculous. So that's how they kind of get away with it, is making a celebrity wing. One day it'll be a physical Hall of Fame, I hope. All right. Also, I'm not too sure if a referee has been inducted, so do you think at some point we should get a referee inducted? If so, who? I mean, Earl Hebner, for God's sakes. Tim White, uh, I think, are two right there. Uh, Charles Robinson is another Absolutely. Or, or any of the ring announcers like Tony Chimmel, the Fink. Well, he's already been inducted, I think. You know, guys like that. So, yes, they should absolutely do it. And, and well, there you go. I, I didn't even look at your list here. The next sentence you said, who I think the most respected referees in the industry, I think of Charles Robinson, Mike Kyoto, Earl Hebner. Some of the greatest wrestling matches that have ever happened in the WWE were refereed by one of these three men. To me, it's long overdue that these three referees and many others that forgot to, I forgot to name are inducted into the Hall of Fame. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Earl Hebner is one of my all-time favorites. Probably my favorite is Earl Hebner. I love the way that he would and just he wouldn't put up with anybody's BS. He actually seemed like a smart referee. Uh, he fit and looked the part. I remember him shoving Triple H at one point, standing up for himself. Remember that? And he did the quick count on Triple H. I think it was like 2001 or so, 2002. Uh, or maybe even 2000, somewhere in that range. I love the way that Earl Hebner counted the three. He wouldn't race to do the three count. Where today, if you were actually to watch most referees, the three count is less than three seconds. It shouldn't be. I think the pacing of the one, two, three needs to slow the hell down. Um, one of my pet peeves, but one final question on the Hall of Fame. I know most people will disagree with me here, but do you think at some point, maybe 15, 20 years from now, Chris Benoit gets inducted into the Hall of Fame? In my opinion, from a pro wrestling standpoint, at some point in the future, he should, even though the events of the personal life overshadowed his amazing wrestling career that spanned over 20 years in five different wrestling promotions. The guy was a world champion and one of the most respected wrestlers in the industry before that unfortunate family death. Well, 
No, I don't. I mean, it, it's not an unfortunate family death when you know you, you you murder your family, your kids, and then kill yourself. I know there was the CTE thing, all of that. It's still hard to excuse, you know, what he did and the way he killed them. And like, I mean, it's it's I don't think ever going to happen ever. I don't care how much time passes. I really don't think it'll ever happen because, you know, don't forget we're in the internet age and we're in the internet age now until infinity, which means nothing will ever go away, which means even when you and I and everyone listening are dead and gone, they will still be able to dig up Chris Benoit. If Chris Benoit somehow his legacy lives on or his, at least his work body of work lives on and someone goes, wow, why, why haven't they inducted them? If WWE tries that, someone's just going to Google it and be like, oh, well he killed his family. What the hell are they doing? It's, it's not going to, you can't ever unfortunately separate the two anymore when it comes to the hall of fame. If you want to just have a discussion about his work on a podcast or write an article about it, absolutely. But when it comes to inducting him into the hall of fame, that's like WWE putting his, their stamp of approval on this guy's body of work, what he meant to the business and him as a person. It's not just his in-ring contributions. You cannot, cannot unfortunately separate the two when it comes to Hall of Fame, because it's more than just in-ring. You know, so uh, no, I, I would be very confident on that. Never will they ever induct him in the Hall of Fame. He uh, took himself out of that conversation when he did what he did. So, man, yeah, I don't really talk a whole lot about Chris Benoit on the show. He comes up from time to time, you know, and uh, man, that's a whole nother. Maybe I'll just make an episode out of that. Not to make it be a dark episode, just phew, so much there. All right, just one brief rant. Can we not, WWE, can we not have a stupid way in every single time there's a, quote, larger-than-life wrestler? This is not boxing. This is professional wrestling, or as WWE calls it, sports entertainment. Case in point, next week on Raw, there's, there is one between Brock and Omas. But like I said, enough said on that. Signing off, a thank you and peace. So I, I, I was initially going to be complaining about that as well, but here's the thing. When you've only got one card to play with this match, what are you going to do? Because if they get physical, which inevitably, I mean, it's going to happen. You're not going to have Brock German Omos or F five him until WrestleMania. That's what you, that's the selling point. That's what you're going to pay to watch happen. That's the payoff is the F five or F five. So it'll probably take more than one F five to put Omos down and the Germans. He'll probably get a few of them, probably five or less. I, I don't imagine Omos taking too many Germans, even though it's going to happen. So my point is, when this is all the match is, the way in kind of makes sense. There's nothing else to this match. It's just size differential. It's can Brock pick Omas up. That's when you boil it down to just the basic, uh, that, that's what it is. So when that's the only card they've got to play, the way in makes sense. Now, when they put the way in on a match that has more depth, I agree it's kind of overplayed. For this instance, I'll let, I'll let it go. All right. Thank you, DJ. Let's, uh, I, I think, wait a minute. I'm going to check my emails. I think that's it for the emails. So emails are brief this week, guys. Let's just uh, dive right into those voicemails. I know I'm ready. How about you? Let's do it. Hello, WWE Podcast World. This is DJ Kuzmo back at it again on your mailbag show. We're calling to you live on a Wednesday morning. And before we get to the video, my heart report. I want to give a shout out of shout outs to Mr. and Mrs. Casual Wrestling Fan for having me back on their show for the second week in a row on this WWE Town Hall meeting on the Good Morning WWE alongside Kanye Twitty, alongside Mr. Michael Ritter, host of the SmackDown Review Podcast. We had an awesome time talking about WrestleMania, having our debates, talking about what's going on in the WWE and having a lot of laughs. This was such a great experience to be alongside some other like-minded wrestling fans. And of course, it is a long audio episode, so you can listen to this on your way to work. You can listen to this at any time.
time of the day because it was such an awesome episode. Stupendous, as Pat McAfee would say. Stupendous. So, if you did not get a chance to listen to this recent episode of the Good Morning WWE, please do before WrestleMania because it will be one of the best episode experiences of your life. Now, let's get back to the Veer, the Veer, the Veer, the Veer Mahad Report. Now, the Veer Mahad Report took place last night on NXT, but for the second Tuesday in a row, we did not get an appearance of Veer Mahad. We did not get an appearance of Sangha, but we did get an appearance of the modern day Maharaja Jinder Mahal as he staked his claim to the NXT North American Champion that he wants to be included in the Fatal Five Way at NXT Stand and Deliver. Next week on NXT, there will be a Battle Royal. The winner of that Battle Royal will be the final member to be included in the Fatal Five Way for the NXT North American Championship, which of course is held by Wes Lee. Jinder Mahal says, I want to be that last person. I want to be the one, the last man standing in that battle royal. And I hope to God he does, because of course, uh, hopefully we get to see the initiator of my guy, Veer Mahal Sangha, the initiator back together, hopefully to support none other than the modern day Maharaja Jinder Mahal next week on NXT. Once again, this is your boy DJ Kuzmo. Have a blessed week. Have an awesome week. Be kind to one another. Stay see my friends, and peace. DJ, great point. I'm, you know, I feel like I should have been promoting it more, but the episode we did, well, I didn't do anything. You guys did. <laughs> uh, that you guys did for the WrestleMania Town Hall. That was about an hour and a half, maybe a little longer. Uh, hosted by Mr. and Mrs. Casual Wrestling Fan was awesome. If you haven't listened to that, guys, do yourself a favor. As DJ said, you can listen to it throughout your day at work. It's longer than most of the shows we do here. Absolutely dive into it. I mean, it's a collection of some of our best co-hosts on here, and definitely take a listen to it. Great insight into WrestleMania, and appropriately named the WrestleMania Town Hall. So, good stuff, and thank you for keeping us updated on the Indus year. And, and yeah, unfortunately, they didn't make an appearance this week on NXT, but... But Monterey Maharaja is the de facto leader of that group. If he's getting a potential entry into the fatal five way for the NXT championship. So good to hear. Thank you for the update. I hope to see your tag team as I keep predicting. I think they will show up after WrestleMania on the main roster. I'd really do the tag team division as always needs some help, whether it's SmackDown or raw, it needs help. And if Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn take the championships, as many people believe they will from the Usos, you're going to need some heel challengers. And I think the Indusheer can fit that spot very nicely. It's also a refresh. It you know, kind of adds a little spice, something new. Good stuff. Thank you, DJ. And everybody check out the WrestleMania Town Hall. I posted it uh, a few days ago. All right. Let's get to our next voicemail. Hey, it's Kyle from Baltimore. So I wanted to just talk about um, the situation with, with uh, Owens and Sami. I was, I'm going to watch this match right now. I'm in the, in the first segment, so I don't know what's going to happen in, in the main event or whatever. Whatever just going to um, Chris Byer with them coming coming together and taking down the Usos, whenever that will be. But always just keep refusing. Um, and so at this point, there's only a few more weeks to WrestleMania. How can he build up to this match when there's no? Again, this is this is one this is one of of, of at least two matches that. The build, there is no, there's nothing for it. There's no build to it, to it. Owens just keep refusing, and Ray is, is still denying to face his son at WrestleMania. So it's like, are they really going to wait till the final SmackDown to have Owens and Sammy to come together and, and, um, having Ray and Dominic to face each other? Or if, in this, in, in this scenario, wait till the end of the show? For 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 tonight for Owens and Sammy, Sammy Sammy to come together or something I don't know. Point is is that I just don't know what it just, it just feels like the, the entire lead up to WrestleMania as before it just has been not all that great. The build to has been great and Cody Rose being the person to try to put them together. I don't know why he cares to have Owens and Sammy together. So what do you just think about that scenario and? You know, why does Rhodes care too much about this? Uh, but that's it. Thanks for my call. Bye. All right, Kyle. Well, your answer 
has already been given since the end of the show. You saw them reunite. So I, yeah, I, I think it was actually well done. I was I, I, emotional for it. They did a great job in execution, even though we all know it was coming. <clears throat> you know, they certainly waited till the last second, but not to be outdone by Rey Mysterio and Dominic, who have yet to make anything official. And I still am against them doing anything at the Hall of Fame. I think that would be a mistake because it would say that, you know, the storyline is more important. A, a storyline, any storyline is more important than what is going on at the Hall of Fame. And I don't think that sends the right message in any way. So hopefully they wrap things up this week. And I think they will. And uh, you mean, in other words, getting things official between Ray and Dom. Now, when it comes to Sammy and Kevin, yeah, certainly they did wait very late into WrestleMania season two weeks before to have them reunite. But now that they have, you have a nice team and you have a team that's believable and heavily favored to beat the Usos for the tag team titles. Uh, You know, I think that they have a good reason to put the belts on them. Yeah. Now, Cody Rhodes trying to bring them together. At first, I was just like, man, they are doing everything to put this guy in the best light possible. He's the he's the healer. He's the you know, the sentimental favorite. His daddy died. Oh, my God. They're doing this for the family. And he comes out such sharply dressed and he's always putting the best light. He's saving Sami Zayn. Now he's trying to bring Kevin Owens and Sammy together. Yeah, you know, that has it has been a little much. It's been a little, uh, you know, gooey and icky for me. But he did at least explain why he has a vested interest. And that's because he had said to Kevin that, you know, you're the one that introduced me to my friends that helped me start, you know, my own business, basically, and help other guys make more money. Referring to the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega which are good friends with Kevin Owens and that whether that actually happened or not, I I intending believe tending to believe that Kevin Owens was the reason that there was a connection between Cody and the young bucks and, and Kenny Omega. So if that's true, then he's just trying to return the favor to help him reunite with his friends, a friend of Sami Zayn. So fine. At least, you know what? I'm giving them credit for at least trying to tell us why Cody Rhodes even cares. Instead of just out of nowhere, he's the he's the moderator. He's the one that's trying to be the peacemaker. I'm glad they gave us something, so I'll, I'll stick with that. Thanks, Kyle. Let's get to our next one. Alex, the French guy here, your current European champion. I've been calling this week to say once again that I'm not super impressed about WrestleMania this year. Pretty average card in general. The potential to be like a, a, one of the biggest cards was there, is there, but you know the um, the build toward WrestleMania was really bad. I think not super bad in terms of Sami Zayn and Roman Reigns, but also the mid card is average, except for LA Knight. And yeah, it's not at average, but it could be better. And I, I want to I want to talk about what's past WrestleMania, because WrestleMania, we pretty much know what's happening. First, Roman re- retained that a fact. There's absolutely no way Cody Rhodes will win at this WrestleMania. Doesn't make any sense for his for character. Doesn't make any sense for Roman Reigns to lose now. And yeah, all the mid-cards, we can predict pretty much what will happen. The storyline with Edge and Finn Balor will come to an end, because Edge is running out of his contract in, I think, some matches. I don't know exactly how, but it's less than six or less than ten. And he's having a contract for, I think, five or seven matches left. Uh, maybe more, but not too much. I think until the, this summer, he, he will, he will get the boots, uh, and, uh, take his retirement and, and stop, stop wrestling. And for the other other matches, I'm really big on LA Knight at the moment. I was always big on LA Knight. He, he's the guy, like he's a very organic guy. He he's follow he follows the lead by the writers. Apparently, also executive of WWE are very um, happy with this. But yeah, uh, very average card. But after WrestleMania, I really don't don't know what story they will bring up. Maybe they will continue on the Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns, which is very average. I think, I think the better move 
is to build Cody Rhodes on his side and build one of the biggest storylines involving Seth Rollins. He should be the one to dethrone Roman Reigns. He's a good guy. He's a good talent. He's been having so much losses recently. He, he could have the possibility to go everywhere, anywhere, but he stays with WWE. Of course, there's a contract, but he could. He was never, he never told that he was unhappy with the situation. I think he really, really did. All right, Alex got cut off a little bit at the three minute warning, but okay. WrestleMania. I feel you to some degree that it's a not a great build. It's not a great, it hasn't been amazing. And I think part of that is that over the years, we've been conditioned to have these Attitude Era stars come out of nowhere, have great matches, or uh, you know, come out of retirement. And I think we need to stop leaning on that and, and uh, you know relying on the stars of yesteryear to come out and produce because that's not fair. And I, the business is about new stars. It should always be about new stars. But to say that it's an average card, though, I, I mean, average in terms of what star power or who they could have matched up. You know, Omas and Brock, I think so far people are more interested than I would have imagined, and I'm more interested than I thought I'd be. So that's, you know, a success so far. Uh, you know, you have Cody and Roman, which is going to be an amazing matchup from just a wrestling, even if you don't like the story, the wrestling on this show from a just in ring, take the storylines aside, is going to be excellent, I believe. Excellent. You're going to come away with this going, wow, okay. They got me invested. It may not be the best WrestleMania I've ever seen, but it certainly exceeded expectations. So I guess if you want to surprise yourself, make yourself feel better or give yourself a chance to be, I guess, uh, look at the pay-per-view and say that it overachieved, set the bar really low, right? Set the bar super low. That way when it, you know, then there's not much that needs to be done for you to be, uh, to, to look at it and go, wow, that, that was better than I thought, right? So <laughs> depends how you want to put your mindset on this, but as far as the card being average, again, it's Edge and Finn Balor is from a wrestling perspective. I think it's going to be very good. I think Cody and Roman's going to be excellent. I think Seth Rollins and Logan Paul has the potential to steal the show. Again, all from in ring, right? Some of the stories I agree haven't been great, but to your point about Seth Rollins being a guy that could face Roman, hell yeah, he's another. He's also really over as a babyface right now. For the first time in his career, he's over being obnoxious so that he doesn't have to try to hide his obnoxiousness. It's just out in the open and people have accepted it, which is why I think it's working better than him trying to play the straight, straight lace babyface in years past that never worked. And he's absolutely a candidate to face Roman and be Roman. This is why I'm telling you, and I agree that Roman Reigns, I think, is favored in my mind from a pure moving forward past mania that you want to talk about uh, storyline perspective. They haven't got there yet. How have you not gotten to Roman and Seth for the championship yet? That's an untold story. Jay versus Roman untold. You want to go back to Sammy? You can absolutely do that. You know, like there, Randy Orton's coming back. There are so many untold stories that Roman has yet with the championship that he has yet to, to tie up. So this, the, the card for Roman or the evidence for Roman retaining and this, this, the, I think the, uh, the argument for Roman retaining is much stronger than him losing because, okay, you get the moment of mania and then, okay, Cody's champion, but like you have untold stories that Roman could have had with this legendary run. And then you cut the thousand days short. You can't, you know, have that nice round number, the documentary, the thousand day reign. Like you think about that. Again, it just doesn't make sense from a business perspective. Dollars and cents, it doesn't make sense. You may pop a rating. People just tune in to see how Cody is his champion you know, out of a curiosity factor. Maybe some stick around, some don't. But the ratings have been indisputable. With Roman as champion, especially on SmackDown, the ratings have been up a lot and consistently. So why mess with the formula? You know, so, all right, that's my rant. I'm with you. I'm with you. All right. But uh, let's get to our next voicemail, guys. Oh, hey, Matt. It's Devin here. Um, <clears throat> just been watching a bit of Raw this morning. And, um, um, God, I can't see as much as I probably don't want the Anchor Bellier to win. I think in this case, it's who I find least annoying. And I think there's just more depth to the Anchor's character. I would like Oscar to win, but she can't talk. 
and I know you've mentioned this over, so I won't, you know, please don't feel obliged to talk about it again on how we know. All, all Oscar does is shout and scream and says no one's ready for Oscar, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I just can't, I, I can't see Bianca losing this. And then hopefully then she turns heel or something happens. Uh, my other, my other comments I've got is, my word, they use the grandest stage of them all and the, um, what's the, the showcase of the immortals. Those comments that have been said every time on Raw and SmackDown, I can't wait for WrestleMania to be over sometimes just because of that. It's like, good God, they shove it down our throats, don't they? And, but anyway, oh, and one last thing I noticed was when Dominic Mysterio had his match, you know, he walks down to the ring and he's got his, um, you know, his teardrop tattoo under his eye from when he did hard time and ran his block. Uh, it's just this great stuff. But somehow between him going down for the match and after the match when he cut a promo again running down his dad, the teardrop was missing from under his eye. Um, so it was clearly a sticker or something that was on there prior, but it, it was gone. And it just made me think twice there for a second. I was like, hang on, where is it? So yeah, there was just a bit of a, a little bit of a, wardrobe, a, a wardrobe malfunction in terms of a uh, little teardrop tattoo that just went missing. Anyway, um, chat soon. See ya. Bye. Hey, Bevan, you had me laughing about the teardrop tattoo. I forgot about that. You know what? It, 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 I wouldn't actually consider it a wardrobe malfunction. Whether it was by design or not, doesn't that make it even funnier that this 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 guy, this this kid, Dominic, can't even get a tattoo? Maybe he, he's, you know, he, he was too scared to get it on his face, so he went with a sticker like a henna tattoo or something. Doesn't that make it more funny and more cowardly and more fraudulent to, to use a sticker? You know what I mean? It kind of fits him, even though it was missing and maybe they did it by design and forgot. But I, I view it as I'll, I'll choose to view it as it fits his character because he's such a fraudulent, tough guy in every sense. He can't even get the tattoo to pretend he is. He has to use a sticker, which is also a, a representation of a fake tattoo that represents him on a larger level of a fake tough guy. I don't know. That's a more fun way to look at it. But. As far as WrestleMania waiting for it to be over and, and shoving down our throats and how many times they talk about the showcase of the immortals and everything. Well, it is. It always gets to the point this time of year where it's it's kind of like the build and the build. You you start to get to the point where you're like, can we just get to this? Because it is so heavily marketed, especially if you watch all the TV shows, right? And you 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 don't have Hulu or you just watch the full three hours of Raw and you see all the commercials on SmackDown. Like it's certainly and if you watch NXT it is going to be shoved down your throat. But if you're WWE, will you take the fans getting annoyed by that over the potential of reaching new eyeballs? I mean, they market the hell out of this because they know that it is the biggest thing that they have. It's the biggest pay-per-view. It's the most recognizable brand name that they have. I would too, even at nauseum where fans are just so tired of it. Fans are going to complain about it, but they're not going to stop tuning in, even if they're sick of the promotion. You know, you and I may be annoyed, and fans that watch all the time are annoyed, or the casual fans that that, that are annoyed. But you expect that number one, and number two, why not squeeze every drop out of this brand name that you can of WrestleMania? It is their biggest cash cow. I would too, knowing that it's going to anger some fans and and annoy them. But I'll take the money over you know, annoying a few people, right? Now, um, as far as your, your, your final point here, Bianca's character and Asuka just can't win. I agree. Asuka, Asuka can't win here. I, I mean, spoiler alert, there's just no way. I, I wouldn't bet the house on it, but I'd say there's like an 80% chance that Bianca Belair retains. But something agreed has to happen here. I need a heel turn from Bianca. Bianca has been flat for a while. Her promos are the same formula. She's always twirling the ring down with her hair, skipping like she's about to play hopscotch. I, I, I think they need to do something more with Bianca. Her heel turn is perfect. The question is, though, what's the counter move? You have to have something balance out that major heel turn. You can't just have everyone be heels, you know, so there needs to be that balance. Um, that's another discussion, but absolutely. There needs to be something with somebody as talented as Bianca is 
in the ring. You know, her character's flat right now. She needs to do something. WWE needs to do something. She is is just vanilla as it gets on the mic right now. And there's just no there's no there's no you know there's no emotion for fans, I don't think, going into this match. None. It's just like, all right, well, I guess uh I guess Bianca's gonna face Asuka. It feels like just kind of a raw main event, doesn't it? Not even that, maybe just kind of like, you know, the, the top of the second hour match. So yeah, they need to do something huge with this at Mania. If not, I, I don't know what they're doing. It's the time to do it. And that's that's all I got to say. But I agree. There's more to Bianca. Absolutely. And a heel. She's already a heel, and people just don't see it. Thank you, Bevan. Let's get to our next one. Hey, everyone. It's New York, Kyle. I know it's been a little bit. But I just wanted to come on and quickly say that WWE took a 23. I pre-ordered it like a, couple, uh, like, uh, a month before it came out. And honestly, uh, I really, I love it. <laughs> I, I actually love it. If you, if you were a fan of 2K22 and all the modes in 2K22, it's basically that game, but better. Because it's all the same modes, but like more features to make them better. And, uh, it's really good. I have it on PS4 because, uh, PS5s here in New York are hard to get right now, man. Hard to get. PS5s. PS5, I, I'm not going to be able to get these, but for a while, it's like I'm not going to be able to get probably GTA 6 for a while. When is that coming? GTA 5, man. GTA 5 Online is great. I love it. The new update just came out last week. It's really good and all. But GTA 6 and PS5 are both very hard. Oh, no, not hard. GTA 6 is, 6 is not out yet. It's going to be a while. Just like PS5 is going to be a while to get. That's, all, that's, that's my point. But anyway, uh, one more thing. I I saw that uh, there's gonna be a little title match for the European title uh, on WrestleMania weekend of Dennis and, uh, and and the champion. And all I'm gonna say is I want next to her wins that match. I want to be the next challenger in line. That's it for me. Talk to you guys next time. All right, Kyle. So you're declaring yourself kind of like everyone does at the Rumble that they're just in the match, right? You're, you're taking that approach. <laughs> all right. Cool. Well. As far as 2K23 goes, I, I still haven't downloaded it yet. I was lucky enough to get my hands on a PS5 last year. And I can't believe... How many years has it been since it launched? And it's still sold out? People still have to do the waiting rooms and or, or be price gouged on eBay to get their hands on this? It's unbelievable. Now, I know the chip shortage and COVID and the uh, you know, all those things played a factor. But, man, it's almost unfathomable that... Anyone who wants a PS5 at this point can't get one. And I feel for you. I went through that. It's a pain in the neck. And you got to follow those those uh, restock bots on Twitter. And they immediately alert you. And then you go there. Like, oh, Target has one. And then you immediately go there. And they're already taken. I've been there. I was there. Um, yeah. And so I'll, I'll definitely be downloading 2K23. I've heard nothing but good things. IGN gave it like an 8.4 out of 10, which is there are, there are tough graders. Some are 9 out of 10. I mean, I've heard nothing but really good stuff. So I'll be on that really quick. I've got a PS5. I've got a decent quality TV. So yeah, I'm spoiled uh, to rotten. But yeah, definitely. I was spending the exorbitant amount maybe for the Icon Edition or something. Um, so yeah, uh, as, that, as far as that goes, check it out. But um, you know, when it comes to GTA, yeah, I don't talk much about this game because it's, this isn't a video game podcast, but it's been 10 years since GTA 5 came out, 2013. And we all saw the leaked footage of GTA 6, which has been confirmed that it's real. And that hasn't, that's not finished footage. That's kind of like beta footage. It's not fully filled in. There's not the reflections and the ray tracing aren't in there and all that stuff. But it's going to be next generation only. You know, so if it's next gen only and most people, not most people, there's a good chunk of people that don't have a PS5 that want to get one, then that means GTA 6 isn't going to get the maximum amount of, uh, of exposure or sales when the, the moment that it's released, which I think will be next year. I, from what I understand, it is 2024, probably holiday season 2024, like something like that. That's my guess, probably fall of 2024, um, which means 11 years later they'll release it. But at the same time, they're not in any rush as well because they want to let this new generation of hardware mature and and make sure that as many people that can get the PS5 have it. You know, and of course, there's Xbox and things, but the fact is you want as many people to have it that could that could buy the game to be able to. 
So it's also that. But um, I feel you. GTA 5 is uh, certainly outstated. It's welcome, I think. I'm, I'm done with GTA 5. I'm just like, it's almost, I don't know. It's frustrating. As a, it, How many games out there come out like decade, over a decade later? It's unbelievable. But they've got the best video game that you've ever seen. And GTA 6 is going to be already the biggest, most, probably the, in terms of number of downloads or purchases from the physical copies to sales, it's going to break every record for any video game ever. So, including Hogwarts Legacy, which just like shattered a bunch of records. So, thanks, Kyle. Let's get to the next voicemail. Hey, Matt. It's Robert from the WWE Ringside Podcast. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to talk about real quick. Um, first, uh, Bray Wyatt. Uh, I guess before he returned to WWE, he was dealing with a bout of COVID. And apparently that's what this physical issue is from reports that I'm reading and seeing. It's uh, a heart-related condition uh, that he got um, from COVID. So that is why he appears to be out right now. Um, not a mental issue from what I'm seeing, which is it's good. And mental state is, is good. So um, it looks like it's a, a COVID heart issue, um, which isn't good either, but um, we might have more answers that way. Um, next is, um, I feel like Roman is going to start getting really paranoid with just hearing how Jay and Jimmy are going to turn on him. And I think he's going to actually pull the trigger before they do because he doesn't want what happened with Sammy when Sammy attacked him to happen again with Jay, have Jay attack him blindside. So I think he's going to actually have Solo take out Jay. And that will lead to a rift between Solo and Roman. Um, but that's how we're going to get that. We're going to get Jay not actually wanting to turn on Roman, but Roman's paranoid by hearing he's going to, and he has Solo take out Jay for him. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, that's all I got for this week. A uh, short one. Have a good one. Bye. Hey, Robert. Thanks for clearing that up. I, I didn't follow up on that uh, as far as what the problem was or issue was with the quote unquote physical issue with Bray. I had, you know, kind of. I kind of assume that it's a possibility when they say physical, it's just a, uh, it's a cover for something mental because he has a track record of mental problems. But uh, if it's a COVID heart issue, is that really any better though? (laughs) You know, like when it, when it comes to being able to wrestle, is that any better? Is that an improvement over a potential mental problem? I I mean, who's to say, you know, so we haven't heard much about Bray Wyatt and uh, Bobby Lashley. I haven't heard a, a peep, but I don't think many people are that disappointed anyway about uh, about this potentially not happening because it came out of nowhere. Bobby Lashley on promos has been underwhelming, to say the least. Uh, Bray Wyatt is all over the damn place. His character's kind of a mess. He's still intriguing and no doubt a, a magnet on TV. But boy, is he all over the damn place. Uh, and so I don't think many people were that sad that this isn't, or if it doesn't happen, that people will uh, you know cry a river. So uh, as far as Roman pulling the trigger before his solo or before they do and using solo to take out Jay. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's a good point, but is, here's the thing is that going to make Jay look foolish for trusting Roman. And he's only now a baby face because he got kicked out of the bloodline. It's kind of like when Seth Rollins got kicked out of the authority and all of a sudden we're like, well, why are we supposed to feel sympathy for you when you're the one that didn't see it coming? You weren't smart enough to see it coming and you got kicked out. You didn't leave of your own volition. You know, so while people will still play along, I look at that logic and I think of that where, you know, like, why are we supposed to feel sympathy for you? Because you weren't smart enough to see this coming and you didn't voluntarily leave. You know, I, I, I'm not a fan of that, but we'll go along with it because Jay versus Roman has a lot, a lot of story to go on. And especially going right back to the beginning of the bloodline when Jay versus Roman happened and then he used Jimmy, uh, Roman used Jimmy as a tool, as a prop to force Jay to quit the match. I mean, they'll bring up that footage. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's happening. It's coming. We know it's coming. The seeds are being planted right now. It's just a matter of, does your scenario happen or does Jay turn on him? Or Jay just leaves again? Or Jay does what Sammy did with the chair? I mean, lots of possibilities. That's why I'm saying 
the the uh, whole scenario, the storylines with Roman as champion. There's so many loose ends and so many great opportunities for great matchups. Like I said, with Jay is absolutely one. Jimmy doesn't interest me so much. Solo doesn't interest me so much at this point from one on one perspective. But you you can tell that story when they lose the tag belts to Kevin and Sammy. If they do, then Roman takes out his frustrations and says how much of a disgrace to the family they are and so forth. And again, Randy Orton returning, if they want to play on that storyline, Riddle uh, and Randy may come, you know, maybe they're still a unit. Who knows? I don't know where Riddle's at. But there's a lot of great stories left to be told with him as champion. That's why I'm saying I think the the argument for Roman remaining champion is much stronger. But okay, let's get to our final voicemail. Hey, Matt, this is Randy from L.A. Um, I have a few questions for you this week. Uh, first of all, I want to get your opinion on Roxanne Perez in NXT fainting and, and that whole health scare with the stretcher and ambulance. I know you don't watch it NXT, but uh, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it. I wanted to see um, what's your opinion on it. I, I know it probably was cafe, but it doesn't sound like it's real life, but do you think it's a little too edgy with the real life uh, DeMar Hamlin Monday Night Football health scare in real life story that we just had a couple months ago. I, I personally don't think it's a big deal, but I was wondering, do you think WWE thinks about those things when it comes to uh, creative and, and storylines? Now, the next thing that I want to say is, is I, I've got to say that Otis is the luckiest man in WWE. For, first, you pull Mandy, now Maxine, Real quick, can you rank those two first, Matt? Okay, anyways, some guys have all the luck. My question is this. Do you find the story titillating? I've, I've got to admit that most stories with Otis are a little bit of a guilty pleasure. I, I wanted to see what you think of this whole storyline. And then once this story plays out and Chad Gable most likely turns babyface, do you think they're going to elevate him, or will he still stay a glorified jobber? like he's been for the past six months. I see a lot of Daniel Bryan, Sami Zayn, just personality to take off once this guy becomes babyface. Um, yeah, I, I think there's bigger potential there. And then lastly, I want to talk about the power of positivity. Because this week there was some pretty positive news. Since they're your absolute favorite thing about WWE, are you happy about the reports that Vince McMahon wanted to break up New Day, but they fought to stay together, possibly just for you, Matt. If that report is true, you have many, many more years of watching your favorite tag team personalities blowing the trumpet and acting like idiots every single week. Stay positive, Matt. <laughs> All right, have a great week. Bye. Oh, boy. You, 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 you really know how to sell it to me when I think about how many more years we could have of blowing trumpets and inside jokes and references to things that are childish and uh, Xavier holding the the microphone like a wine glass and all the stupid jokes and not caring about anything and nothing serious. Oh, man, I mean, you, you talk about what uh, what's right up my alley with pro wrestling. You know how to sell it to me, buddy. <laughs> but uh, all right, Randy. So let's talk about Otis first or Otis. <laughs> um, I... L actually find this entertaining. It is a guilty pleasure of mine too. Like Otis is, or Otis, excuse me, Otis is talented, multifaceted. He knows how to, they, they tried the monster thing. And when he shaved his face, that was kind of weird. I, I like him with a beard, but he knows how to play the monster. And there was a, p a point where I was like, well, they're going to do something with him. You know, he, you remember how many times that Randy Orton tried to RKO him in that match? And he just, he's un RKO -able. And he finally hit it, and I was like, well, they're doing something here. And they never ended up doing anything serious, but there was a point there, right? And so he's shown there's potential. But do I think that when Chad Gable turns babyface that they're going to do something with him? Well, I think he's already kind of babyface. Was he ever really a heel? He's, I mean, he's, he's kind of the heel that you don't really boo because you feel bad for him, but you know how talented he is. So I don't, I don't ever really consider, never have considered him really a, a true heel, so it wouldn't be hard to flip him completely babyface. I think he's already halfway there. So do I have any faith that they're going to elevate him? I guess the question is, well, it should be refined. To what level? You know, like what what level do you think that he may go? I think he could get to like U.S. title contention. I don't think he'll ever make it to the top.
I mean, just unfortunately, no. But his wrestling acumen is unmatched. Being a real Olympian and, and, and of course, uh, you know, in-ring pro wrestler, his skill set is really unmatched. He is so good that people don't realize it because he's losing all the time. And I think that, yeah, once they split these two up, absolutely, you could absolutely elevate him to a U.S. title contention. And he's good on the microphone, too. It's just a matter of the, the machine getting behind him. And I don't know if they do what that level will look like. Now, lastly, about the Roxanne Perez thing. Admittedly, as uh, you, you know, I don't watch NXT, but I did make a point since you asked to watch it. And, you know, I, I'm okay with it, too. They, I don't think they crossed the line. It's a believable injury. They're not mocking anyone specifically. Uh, you know, they did bring some real elements into it. They didn't do the X sign, right? But they, they had the referees come out and she collapsed in a way. I watched her collapse. That, I mean, it's clearly her protecting herself. It's fine. You know, she she did as good as she could have done falling on the mat. And then Shawn Michaels comes out and the people clap as she's being brought out, which means some people really bought into this being a real injury. I have no problem with this. You know, that's actually something that I wish they'd bring back more of generally is realism, believability, emotion. This generated emotion from a lot of people of sympathy. Absolutely no problem with this. I know, again, in today's society, it's, you know, everyone is uh, concerned about everyone else's feelings. How about we just worry about creating feelings, emotion? Emotion is always going to bring people in, whether you love it or hate it. It's, if someone has a strong opinion about it, that's what you want, okay? And in this case, I think they did a good job. It's believable. It creates sympathy automatically. It gets people talking. Oh, my God, is this real, right? That's what you want. That's what, that's what pro wrestling needs more of. Right. Not meta stuff like talking about like behind the scenes or as Cody always likes to put it peeking behind the curtain or St. Louis. What do you want to talk about? Like, come on, dude. I know I didn't mean to bring Cody into this, but when he when Cody tries to do that stuff and why he thinks what do you want to talk about is going to be a thing? It's not going to be a thing. Okay, fetch isn't going to happen, Gretchen. Okay, those of you that have no idea what I mean. Those that know, know. It's one of my guilty pleasures, sadly. All right. (laughs) And and those that don't know, Mean Girls 2004 movie. Make fun of me all you want. I don't care. It's cool. I've accepted my faults. Mean Girls is one of my favorite movies. (laughs) Not my number one, okay? I've got much more manly movies that are my favorites, but it's in my top 10. So, all right. Now that I lost half the listeners... And many of you look at me differently. I will end it there. And I want to thank everybody for for uh, contributing this week. A little bit shorter than normal on the email side, but you guys deliver on the voicemails. And uh, we are now two weeks away from WrestleMania. Crazy. But here we are, just a, a little bit around the corner. And things are going to heat up. And maybe some of you that aren't excited, including myself, as excited as I feel like I should be, we'll get there in, in, in time. So... Thank you so much, everybody, for contributing. I'll be back this Sunday night with your Week in Review, making up for lost time last week of not being here. And until then, take care. I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show. Or head to WWEpodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.